Good afternoon, everyone. It's kind of strange to be upstaged by yourself. Um, my name is Andy Bitter. Um, as I just said, I'm an evangelist uh, with SAP. I'm not very religious, so it has nothing to do with religion. Um, as an evangelist, you basically just travel around the world and you talk. And um, I've been doing this now for about 30 years. So hopefully uh, my presentation today um, helps you maybe understand what we do, how we see the future, because we're evangelists, we're futurists, we're innovation um, people. And um, in my presentation, I wanted to basically take you a little bit of a journey over the thing that I've been doing for the last 30 years. Before I joined SCP, I was an industry analyst um, at Gartner and a Meta Group for about 15 years. And um, so the uh, uh, last two decades, basically, I just talked to organizations worldwide about analytics and machine learning and big data and whatever the new thing kind of was um, in, the, uh, in the IT industry. So as my talk, um, I also kind of want to show you in terms of what's possible today. And I understand that many of you are technology uh, technologists. I'm getting waved at. Do, do, I, do you want me to do something? Uh, okay. Okay. I'm good? All right. Um, so, um, in terms of what's possible in the technology world, I understand that many of you are programmers and developers and architects, and I did all of that uh, since I came out of university back in the 80s. Uh, so, the, all the talk about AI and machine learning, we kind of did then, certainly when a at a different scale. So, we programmed things uh, in languages that you probably haven't even heard of. So, way before C was invented or C++ or things like Python or Lua or any of those other kind of new technologies. But obviously, if you progress over the years, I mean, you see certainly a lot of changes in, ter in terms of what organizations can do these days. So, you may have seen this one. Um, this is Atlas uh, from Boston Dynamics. Uh, so, this is a robot and one, what, what this guy can do, um, I'm probably not able to do. So they tried to make the guy do a backflip. And the first time it didn't work so well. Then they started to have machine learning sort of implanted in the guy. And at some point, Atlas was actually able to do the backflip. And he wasn't programmed to do that. It learned to do that. So all the different uh, hydraulics and gauges and, and, and sensors were actually able to actually let this guy, this machine, do the backflip. I can't do that. Well, I haven't tried. I, I don't want to hurt myself. But I mean, the things that the machine can do this and learn these things, um, basically based on new technologies you know, from, from some of the sensors. And um, Elon Musk thinks this is kind of kind of lame. I think this is cool. But Elon Musk, obviously, you know the guy, um, who the guy who sends cars into space because he can. Uh, and then, um, so he thinks that there will be certainly lots of more developments over the years. And uh, you can actually see with a new kind of truck that he just announced a couple of days ago. So there's a lot of things that Elon Musk can do. And obviously his brand, the Tesla brand, certainly shows how the new experience looks like. So this is the Tesla autopilot, for example. And you can see this driver isn't actually driving. It's just sitting there, I believe, for insurance purposes. And the car basically just looks at all the various sensors and cameras and backwards and forward cameras and all the kind of various uh, intelligence from machine learning based kind of algorithms. So they're trying to pick out the weather conditions, the road conditions, the traffic conditions and learn inside the car. And what happens then is that this car sends all the information that it gathers while driving on the road to up to Tesla and to the cloud and basically just learns uh, and, and teaches all the other cars on the road and in turn receives all the other information. So which means that this car becomes a better product while it's used. So the usability of the car becomes better because it learns from all the other kind of Tesla cars on the road about certain road blockages or certain weather conditions or there's an icy, icy corner somewhere. So this car basically just becomes a better product while it's used. So think about your product. Can your product learn and become a better product while the user is actually using it? And uh, that's why we uh, at SAP, we're talking about the experience economy, which we are entering. So we're sort of, certainly we came from uh, you know, the industrial revolution and so on. And now uh, the internet, co uh, internet um, economy, and then we are looking at the experience economy. And it certainly has worked well for Tesla. If you compare 
Tesla, for example, with GM. GM, obviously, you know, um, sold about, was it, 10 million cars back in 2016. And that kind of gave them about a 55 billion uh, or 51 billion uh, market cap back in the day. Tesla didn't sell if even a 1% of the amount of cars that GM did, and it has overtaken GM in market cap. Think about that. Why? Because the market, the buyer, uh, the economy thinks that this is how the future will look like. Self-driving cars, exp better ex user experience um, from the experience co economy. So Tesla will certainly be um, um, maybe even growing even better now if this kind of new super ugly, that's my personal, personal opinion, super ugly truck will kind of hit the market. And um, if you go into some, um, some areas, such as Norway, for example, it seems like every second car is an electro uh, electric vehicle made by Tesla. So you can actually see that how some of these kind of changes in the industry based on the, uh, the experience that the user has by driving the car will certainly shape some of the kind of industries. So we're talking about self-improving products, about something that SE is learning while you're doing it, either through machine learning or some other al algorithms basically baked into the product that looks what's happening left and right, whether it's a, a call center bot, uh, basically to, uh, as a jet bot, learning in terms of what the user wants and uh, or some of these kind of self-driving cars. So we're talking about digital business in our company um, and it's, this is sort of the, the best definition of what we can have. It mean, means intelligently connecting people, things, and businesses. Fair enough, sounds pretty simple. If you now um, take one layer off the onion and see what technologies are kind of relevant in that context, it's not so simple because there's a lot of intelligence, um, uh, so there's lots of technologies that you need to master in, in terms of becoming an intelligent enterprise. So obviously, uh, and I'm sure many of you are sort of familiar with some of these machine learning technologies here at the conference, uh, natural language, uh, so speech recognition, natural language generation and, uh, and uh, understanding, analytics, IoT, certainly in the Tesla case, uh, in, in many other kind of industries, IoT is important, networks, services. So all these technologies are sort of important in the bigger context. And how as an organization, and obviously when, at, when we talk to the customers, how do you manage that? because you can have 1,500 data scientists sort of on staff because either, first of all, they're hard to find, they're expensive, and they're relief if they find something better. How do you actually manage some of these technologies in a, in a context, whether you're in retail or in oil and gas or in financial services? Because you need to kind of master, maybe not all of those, but many of those technologies in your IT department and your, in your lines of business. So, and um, that's certainly something that we're trying to help our clients going forward. I have a few examples later on that shows some of those uh, basically in action. At the core of it, it's, you know, it's all data. It's all about the data. In fact, um, I don't want to repeat it, you know, the data is a new oil. I mean, it's more the kind of lame kind of metaphor there. Uh, but data is pretty much at the core of everything we do. Whether you're putting the data into an algorithm or whether you're reporting on it or you're using it for a dashboard or you're feeding a, a neural network with it. I mean, it's all about the data. And um, from an SAP perspective, the stuff in the in the red circle is where we all started. This is you know, R2, R3 back in the day in the 70s and 80s. That's how we started. Uh, it was all about transactions. A customer buys a product uh, at a certain price in a certain store, a certain address, and it was delivered by a certain truck. And this is all transactional stuff. Then this whole thing came around with, yeah, there's this other type of data. Back in the day, we could be said, well, this is structured data, which was transactions because it was you know, sitting in a regulation database and a grid with rows and columns. And there was the other type of data, which was text and images and audio and video and some of that. And it was called big data. Well, we hear the big data conference, but I mean, it's not all only about some of those data because there's a lot of other kind of data um, as you see in the right column, um, because on the left, you haven't seen anything yet when you're, when you're not looking in your data management practices what's actually happening with social data and seismic data and sensor data and some of those, because these are just blowing everything else out of the water. I spend a lot of time, for example, in, uh, in the Middle East, um, working with some of the oil and gas companies. 
and they were using seismic data to find oil. I thought, okay, I'm in Abu Dhabi, and so I want oil, I just drill a hole, there's oil. It's actually not that simple. You still need to kind of do some kind of analysis in terms of what the ground under the, c under the surface looks like. And what they did is they, they put little explosions in the ground, set them off, and then the reverberation from the ground uh, was captured uh, so you can actually start analyzing whether there's an oil reservoir in it. So you had to analyze sort of the, the reverberation from some of the seismic data. And it sounds pretty simple. The, the, the difficult part of it is that the data needs to be captured at about a terabyte a second. So you need to really have some really high power technology actually to find that data and actually capture it because if it's gone, it's gone, never, never coming back. So there's a lot of other kind of data that really enables these organizations to make use of it using some of those technologies. And so again, I'm going to provide you with a few examples later on. And the other thing that I typically see is when I talk to customers about big data or BI or analytics or whatever you want to call it, they typically come back with, yeah, I want, to, I want some reports. And to be honest, when I hear that, I want to kill myself. Because reports, uh, reporting is sort of the, the most, the lamest thing that you can think of. Now, reports will never go away, right? And the reports will always be there. So financial reports and sales reports and marketing reports, all of that's good. But if you really want to get some really interesting value out of your data, don't think about the reports. Talk to your customers and your users about some of those things, how you can predict something, how you can find a certain risk or a certain pattern. Uh, and maybe I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but I mean, these are some much more interesting use cases when you think about some of those questions that arise from discussing well, correlation or simulation or, or detection with the users because they don't think in that terms. They think about cool looking dashboards with nice pie charts and donut charts and stuff like that. But in terms of really making use and having actual insights from, the, from, the, uh, uh, from your data, you don't get that from a report. You don't get that from the dashboard unless you're really lucky. This is certainly the real deal. And I would much rather have organizations talk about these things rather than you know, sending out 10,000 reports a day. And what's hindering them is that most organizations that I talk to, and that really goes across the world and across industries, they don't, they, they don't really have even a, a proper BI strategy. Now, as I said, this is, uh, I, I worked at Gartner for a long time. This is actually one of my slides that I presented 10 years ago. This is proof. Uh, this is me on stage at the World Forum in The, in the Hague. I had you know, less gray hair at the time. I was presenting that, and it's still true. You can talk to any organization. You go into any company of pretty much any size, and you ask them, yes, you have all this kind of data, and you do all the kind of technologies from SAPs and, and others, obviously, and show me your strategy around BI. And th that includes all the things that we do here at the conference with machine learning and AI and all, all of that. But it's stunning, to be honest, to actually see how few organizations really have a proper strategy that goes beyond just to decide which tool do we use. Because the tool isn't really important. The tool is just you know the means to kind of deliver something to the end user in whatever the financial department or in the risk department or in the marketing department. It's really all about what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it, then the how is really more about the technology and maybe if you have an SI to help you with because you don't have the data science on staff. But there is a lot more to a proper BI strategy than just picking a certain tool or vendor. I think that's sort of the biggest hurdle that I see in most organizations really getting the best value out of their BI program and BI uh, technologies because they don't even know why they're doing these things. They just think it's about the reports. And that basically just brings me back to my earlier point. It's not about the reports. So then they're, they're saying, okay, we're not doing BI anymore. We're doing AI now. And um, in fact, I have seen presentations where it's almost described as a progression. We're done with BI. Now we're doing AI. Um, okay. Um, and the funny thing is that um, AI really isn't about doing new things. Um, well, there are exceptions to that, but AI is really more about doing the same things, but basically just automating things that we've been doing before, um, and then just doing it faster or cheaper or with a lot, of, lot more data that we, do, that we were able to do when we do it by hand. So I have a few kind of um, 
uh, slides on, on, on AI. I want to start with Doug Engelbart. Who knows Doug Engelbart? Well, he invented the mouse. Well, so you should actually know the guy because you're using his products. So um, he is, uh, there's, a, there's a video of it. It's called The Mother of All Demos, right? Uh, in 1965, I believe, he was doing the first demo of when he invented the mouse. Um, and so really smart guy, but he says, technology shouldn't aim to replace humans, but to amplify human capabilities. I think back in the day, that made a lot of sense. Uh, because we were all thinking, you know, Star Trek came along and you know, we're all going to be replaced by robots. Um, well, we are. Not right now, but I mean, it's happening. And so I have a few examples of that. So I, I researched a little bit more. I looked at Forbes. So uh, Andrew um, wrote an article on Forbes and says, okay, AI will take your job. And yes, it will. So he, his recommendation is, what you can do to protect yourself. So that's like trying to stop a train with your hand. Um, good luck with that. So AI will certainly change the way we do things all around the world. And I have a few examples here. Um, I used to live in California for many years in Silicon Valley. And so this is a, um, an example from there. Um, in the US, maybe, maybe also here in Lithuania or in other places, the biggest threat that parents can give to their kids is if you don't work hard, if you don't learn, if you don't go to school, you'll be flipping burgers for the rest of your life. So, th so that seems to be the ultimate threat parents can, can kind of uh, announce to their kids. So you know, the 16 year old with pimples saying, okay, I gotta go to school. So, they don't even flip the burgers anymore because that's done by the robot. So, and the robot, that's called Flippy, some kind of cafe in Silicon Valley, has Flippy. And the funny thing is, Flippy does it a lot faster, a lot better at the right time, and it doesn't complain. Uh, and it works day and night, um, so you can actually have Flippy basically on call for 24 hours a day. So, again, that job from, you know, your kid that actually went to the burger place to uh, to uh, to earn whatever five dollars an hour, I mean that job is gone, or will be gone. Um, so maybe the next job was being a janitor and sweeping the floors at um, at a supermarket. This is um, at Walmart, and they have robotic kind of janitors now. Now I don't know exactly why there is a seat on that robot and a steering wheel. So maybe the janitor just takes the thing for a spin in the, in the store, but I mean, it doesn't have to. So it, it just goes around and basically just you know, sweeps the floors of the whole supermarket all by itself, by machine learning, image recognition, where are the shirts and shelves, where, do I, where was I before? Pretty much like the Roomba that we have in our kitchen, which just drives around and cleans up the, cleans up the mess in the, on the floor. So again, that job will be replaced by a robot. Um, I live in, in Hamburg in Germany, and this is uh, one of our neighborhoods. It's called the Forest Villages up in the north of the city. And you can actually see that the, the garbage guy who typically stands on the back of the truck is gone, both of them. So basically just you know, the garbage truck drives around, figures out with the arm, okay, where's the next garbage can? Stops, arm comes out, picks up the picks up the garbage can, puts it in the back of the truck, keeps going. So again, that job, and it's typically a rather repetitive job, yes, and it's probably also a very boring job, it's eliminated. Certainly in some of those areas of the town where you can actually have the garbage can outside. So if you're going downtown where there's lots of cars standing around and where it's very narrow streets, it's going to be much more difficult. But again, through AI technology, machine learning, image recognition, and some of those other kind of technologies here at the conference, you can actually do these things live. So it's not that this is Star Trek anything. It's happening. So all the technologies are certainly changing the way we live. This is Okado. This is um, a robotic warehouse in, in the UK. And all of these things that you can see moving around, these are all robots. So these are basically just uh, robots that are basically picking things, replenishing things, charging. You can see how they actually work. You can actually see then um, all the various uh, baskets that are basically just filled 
while an order is processed. So a robot basically just drives around, picks up the stuff from a certain basket, another kind of robot comes around, replenishes the certain baskets, and this is actually driven by an air traffic control system, because obviously you don't want to have these things crash to each other, much like you don't want to have planes in the air crash into each other. So this is again replacing jobs based on AI of um, you know, these runners like they have or at least had in some of the warehouses you know, like Amazon warehouse for example where you have people with carts running up and down the aisles and basically picking some of the things from your order. So again this is all replaceable jobs based on AI much more reliable and much um, uh, in the long run much cheaper obviously than having humans. So the human jobs will absolutely be replaced. So again, that's I don't even have to be a futurist anymore because it's happening already. So all the technology that we're actually discussing here at the conference and elsewhere, it's already in action in some of those industries uh, very well. I'm sure you have seen that before. Um, which one is a dog and which one is a blueberry muffin? So um, if you have a chihuahua, I mean, you can certainly kind of pick that out. And um, there's more than more than these. Uh, which one is uh, the chicken nugget or whatever the thing is? And uh, uh, pretzel. This is this my favorite here? Um, it's it's very hard to actually make a business out of kind of picking out dogs or bobs um, from from images. But the image recognition technology certainly enables organizations to kind of use that technology in a real business context. For example, we have a product that we call Brand Impact. And you can see that uh, all the various logos are sort of marked. And what this does is from a live streaming video, the uh, uh, Brand Impact application uses image technology frame by frame to pick out the certain logos. So if you're a marketing person and, you want to, and you're sponsoring some of these events, you want to see how many times and how often and how big was my logo featured in the video. So we're actually using that same technology of like with the dogs and the pretzels to actually figure out how many times was my logo sped, uh, seen on live, te on live television and was it worth to spend whatever, 10 million or 500,000 euros or whatever currency for that event to actually sponsor it from a marketing perspective. In the past, people were actually sitting in front of the TV with stopwatches and trying to find, okay, there's my logo, there's one, and they missed about 50% of them. Now you basically just have the video run through the image uh, recognition kind of software and basically pick out every every logo at every angle, at every size, and basically just give you a much much better insight there. This is another kind of interesting one from um, from BSF. BSF, huge uh, German uh, chemicals company, they were trying to do invoice matching. Invoice matching um, obviously very difficult because if you're a big uh, conglomerate, you have ten thousands. Of, voice, uh, of invoices and payments coming in and out every month. So trying to kind of find which payment re um, relates to which kind of um, invoice is sometimes very difficult. So they're trying to use regular algorithms, had about 40% matching rate. They use some deep analytics with 70% uh, matching rates because it really becomes difficult because you could have one invoice with five payments or you could have five um, uh, invoices with one single payment or any kind of end to m kind of relation or of thereof. So they used machine learning at some point and they were actually able to kind of get the matching rate to up to 94%, which means that 6% of all the tens of thousands of invoices that actually ha had come in every month had to be done by human because they were so obscure or maybe there were some typos in it that the machine just couldn't kind of figure out what is what. But think about the product productivity gain BSF has, has achieved just by putting all the invoices and all the various payments from the banks into a computer, into a machine learning algorithm and say, you need to figure out what is uh, what. Is what. Um, so I, I talked about uh, um, voice recognition. This is something that we also do. Um, I'm sure you have some kind of Alexa or Google or um, Cortana device, uh, Microsoft device sort of in your house. I have, long, I have long conversations with Alexa in my kitchen. This is sort of the Alexa for the business person. So why why would we only time to talk to to the Alexa or the the, um, the device to play a certain Spotify playlist or what's the weather or do I do I have enough such and such sort of in in stock? So um, 
this is something that the business person, it's called SAP Copilot, and you actually talk in terms of business terms. You can actually see, was a certain invoice paid? And then obviously through image rec uh, through, uh, uh, voice recognition and, uh, and natural language processing, the system understands what you're asking. And uh, it certainly comes back with an answer from, from a business perspective, not about the weather or your Spotify playlist. So that's something, again, where um, machine learning and some of these new algorithms are really using, uh, are really used to actually help the business person in uh, some large organizations. And in, from our perspective, that's my only kind of product slide, if you will. Uh, it's all based on what we call the SO SAP Leonardo portfolio. It includes data intelligence and IoT and blockchain and all the kind of other kind of buzzword kind of technology that we actually have. It's uh, there is some, some design thinking workshops added to it to actually come up with a new solution. And then there is some, some um, um, methodology to actually build out some new new, um, new applications for them. So uh, basically, based on that kind of architecture, really super high level architecture, all the solutions that we, that we build, uh, that's based on. And uh, because there's a lot of machine learning uh, certainly involved, it's not just this one algorithm. There's literally hundreds of machine learning algorithms that we basically bake directly into the application because we know that most organizations don't have the uh, number of data scientists on staff to actually be able to do that. So much it's much easier actually to bake it directly into the application, have the end user which just leverage the, the, the algorithms rather than saying, here's the data, you go and figure it out. So it's all basic, uh, based part of the uh, uh, the application portfolio that we, that we provide. A few examples from uh, some uh, intelligent enterprises that we come across, some SAP, some are not. Um, this is retail, for example. Um, if you're a, a retail app, um, store manager, you figure out that some products are selling better than others. What this company found out that some products aren't selling regardless of whether you have price promotions or not. So the blue area, for example, in the stores is where you didn't have um, very, uh, very fast moving products. What they did is they actually used some kind of a near field communication or, or RFID technology to actually build a sensor directly into the handlebar from the shopping cart. And then they start monitoring the, the locations of the shopping cart in the store. And they found hotspots. You can see the, the red ones. That's probably where the milk is, where because everybody gets milk. And then here in the back, you see other products. And you can actually see that um, some areas in your store are frequented more than others. So maybe um, you need to kind of rearrange the, the store layout to actually have people actually move to some of these areas where you have uh, products that are not selling. So again, they didn't kind of, they don't, they don't know which customer is what, but they know exactly where do people s uh, spend most of the time while they're in the store. Again, this, this information wasn't uh, available, so they actually generated it on the fly. Um, this is uh, a company out of, uh, out of Denmark that I work with. I live, uh, in, as I said, I live in Hamburg. We've got lots of wind, probably like here. Um, and uh, I asked the, the people who are actually building some of these wind farms, how do you decide where to put some of these propellers? And my assumption was, you put these, you know, these generators where there is the strongest wind. Turns out that's not true. It's not the strongest wind that you want, it's the most constant wind that you want. Because the one thing that these turbines don't like is a fluctuation in rotation speed, which means that they much rather turn and turn all the, all the time at the same speed. They don't want to be really slow, no wind, and then you know, spin really fast because there's lots of wind because that has an impact on the wear and tear of the, of the generator, which means it increases the uh, maintenance cost, which basically decreases the yield that you actually get from the generator. So how do you find the constant wind? Company looked at meter meteorological data that was available for the last, I believe it was 80 years, and, and basically analyzed the meteorological patterns of wind channels and wind patterns and some of those to find out where there is the most constant wind. And that's where I wanted to put the generator, not where there's the strongest wind. Again, you had to kind of think outside the box uh, to actually figure out what data would we need to find uh, the proper kind of location for some of these uh, wind farms. Agriculture, probably one of my favorite industries right now because it's not about the farmer with dirty hands kind of driving tractors. These are highly digitized um, industries and, and organizations right now. 
So um, some of these harvesters that are driving around are also kind of information generators, if you will, because they basically just have sensors that figure out what's the nutrition level in the ground, what's the acid level in the ground, what's the water level in the ground, and basically just while they're driving or based, by, based on uh, some of the sensors that they put into the ground, figure out how does you know, my farm and, or my, my plantation look like? Do we have a certain weed problem here? Or do we need to have more fertilizer on this end? Or is it rather dry on, on another kind of corner? In the past, they just had to look and maybe um, drive around with quads and figure out, okay, here's the leaves are turning yellow. Maybe we need to put some more water here. So now, basically, the, the, the machines are basically just doing through some kind of IoT kind of technology, figure out how the plant, how the, how the farm looks like. Another example here, this is, a, a, um, I believe it's palm oil uh, a plantation where they try to figure out th the same information, but these, these plantations are so huge that we're actually now flying drones across it. And in the, um, the use case is that the, the, the drone, while it flies ab uh, across the plantation, takes live video and live imagery from the sky and uh, identifies indeed every single plant and uh, basically you, you now have a, a dashboard of your plantation that you can figure out from the sky um, you know, where you need to kind of either harvest the fruits or where you need to have some water or where you have to have some uh, some nutrition or some fertilizer or some of that. So again, it's a to totally digitalized industry by, the, by now. So again, we basically added uh, new information that we didn't have before to actually make this of more like a digital business. Last time, uh, last one here. Um, this is retail. There's a store. It's called uh, Meat Pack. I'm sure you have not heard of it. It's in Guatemala. It's a shoe store. Very loyal customer base. And um, the one thing is that they are really creative in terms of how they do marketing and promotions. So what they thought is, we, we built an app, and the app basically tracks um, your customer in terms of where it is. If you opt in, obviously. So. Once the app figures out that you're maybe in a mall like this one and you're just entered a shoe store, but you entered an Adidas shoe store or a Nike shoe store, the app says, oops, there's a custom, a potential customer that is probably going to buy a shoe. Why otherwise would the person go into a shoe store? What the app then does is it sends you a text message or like one of these alerts on your phone saying, hey, um, if you want to buy a shoe, you can get the shoe at our store at 99% off. Which means, you know, we're giving away a shoe. And for every second that you wait, that number goes down by one point. So it's 98%, 97%, 96%. There's a video on YouTube, you know, look it up. And you can see the people running through the malls trying to get to the meat pack store because that's where they get the big discounts. The marketing campaign is called hijack, for good reason. They were hijacking the customer which was already in the competitor store and through some location intelligence and through some alg algorithms, basically just based on the location, figured out this is a potential customer. We just need to promote something from our store and the customer come to my store. I hijacked that customer. What do all these kind of use cases have in common? It's the creativity. It's about what you do and how you do it. It's not about having the best data or the most data. It's really about thinking outside of your reporting or dashboarding or algorithm box. It's what can you do with all that data once you actually put some maybe some creative hats on. And I think that's certainly a big of a hurdle, if you, if you will, that I see in organizations, they don't think in that way. They just think we have all this data, what do we do with it? Yeah, let's put a nice dashboard on it. And then we present it to the board of directors and they need to figure out what to do now. So I think this is sort of the, the most critical aspect of um, all these kind of use cases. It's not about the algorithm itself. It's not about the machine learning algorithm or the machine learning or the neural network. It's about what can you do now that you weren't able to do yesterday. And sort of and sort of kind of make some kind of creative use cases out of it. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. I believe we have five minutes for questions, if there are any. <laughs> Otherwise, thank you very much. Yes.